Hello, everyone. Welcome to LG Path Labs monthly uh, pathology webinar series organized by Dr. Libsy Kupta from LG Path Lab. Um, Rajiv uh, Prasad, uh, consultant histopathologist at Queen's Hospital in Romford. And in today's uh, session, I would be talking about uh, Barrett's and some uh, stomach mesenchymal lesions. Now, Barrett's and these mesenchymal lesions form part of an important biopsy, uh, which we, uh, anyone receives in the pathology department. And it's important to uh, discuss and understand how uh, reporting of uh, Barrett's uh, is undertaken in any department. So, First of all, uh, we'll talk about the uh, definition of uh, Barrett's. Now, Barrett's is defined by two colleges. Uh, the American College of Gastroenterology uh, defines extension of salmon-colored mucosa into the tibular esophagus, extending uh, more than equal to one centimeter proximal to the gastroesophageal junction with biopsy confirmation of intestinal metaplasia or goblet cells. And the British Society of Gastroenterology uh, defines as columnar epithelium with or without goblet cells extending more than equal to one centimeter proximal to the gastroesophageal junction. Now, the endoscopic reporting should be performed using minimum data set, uh, which includes the recorded length uh, using the PROG criteria. Now, if you see in the uh, request form, which comes with the biopsies, often the, uh, the request card will mention uh, PROG criteria that uh, C followed by a numeral number and M followed by a numeral number. It's important to understand what the C and M stands for. So C is basically the circumferential extent of the uh, endoscopically visible columnar line esophagus, and M is the maximum extent. So C is a circumferential extent and M is the maximum extent, and they're both measured in centimeters. Now, screening of uh, Barrett's. So patients with uh, chronic uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease symptoms and multiple risk factors uh, of at least three of age 50 years or older, white race, male sex, obesity, and the threshold should be lowered in multiple risk factors or presence of family history, which includes at least one first degree relative with Barrett's. Now, it's also important to understand the long short uh, segments and also the Z line. So long segment is basically any segment of Barrett's which measures more than uh, three centimeter. Uh, short segment is any segment of Barrett's uh, which measures less than three centimeter. And also we come across the Z line, which is uh, the squamous columnar junction. Now, often uh, you get the irregular Z line mentioned in the uh, reports. Now the irregular Z line is basically the uh, presence of columnar line esophagus, but, uh, but less than one uh, centimeter. And this is often seen in cases uh, with uh, Gastroesophageal junction, uh, gastroesophageal uh, reflux disease. Now, so how do we report Barrett's? So Barrett's, uh, uh, there are uh, various uh, pictures uh, you see under the microscope uh, 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 in terms of uh, when you when you uh, start reporting Barrett's. So one is where you see what you see here is this squamous line uh, esophageal uh, uh, epithelium and along with underlying columnar epithelium uh, showing background mild, uh, chronic inflammation. And what is more striking here is these goblet cells or the intestinal metaplasia. Now, if you see this squamous epithelium is pretty much unremarkable, uh, but the columnar mucosa shows uh, intestinal metaplasia. So we here in this case, we report as the appearances are corroborative of an endoscopic diagnosis of columnar line esophagus or Barrett's esophagus. And uh, we don't forget to add uh, a sentence that provided these biopsy, this biopsy is taken from the native esophagus. 
The other scenario is where you don't see the esophageal taps squamous mucosa, but what you see under the microscope is what you see here is the glandular mucosa. Uh, and, and what you see is the very pronounced uh, intestinal meroplasia or goblet cells here. And there is uh, mild scattered uh, inflammation in the background. So again, here we say the appearances are corroborative of an endoscopic diagnosis of columnar line esophagus uh, or Barrett's esophagus. And again, we had the same sentence uh, provided the biopsy is from the native esophagus. Now, the third scenario is, well, the third and fourth scenario is like what you see here. So in this particular picture, what you see is these cremous uh, mucosa, which is pretty much unremarkable with glandular mucosa and another uh, biopsy showing just glandular mucosa with some background chronic inflammation. Now, what is common in these both, uh, two biopsies are lack of intestinal metaplasia. So you don't see any goblet cells here. So what we say is uh, the appearances are in keeping with, uh, but not specific for columnar line esophagus or Barrett's esophagus, uh, provided the biopsy is uh, taken from the native esophagus. And we tend to add a paragraph saying that this appearance could represent the OG junction or the stomach with or without hiatal hernia. Now, an important thing to note uh, to mention here is, uh, although we don't see intestinal metaplasia here, uh, it's uh, very important uh, to seek uh, special stain, uh, for example, just to a PASD stain. Uh, if in case there is any Apache incomplete intestinal metaplasia, which is much more clearer when you see another special stain. So that's an important uh, clue. Now, the last scenario here is there's a curry of Barrett's and then what you see under the microscope is what you're seeing here. Where you just see uh, esophageal type squamous mucosa um, and you don't see any underlying columnar mucosa. So we say here, the appearances of without evidence of columnar line esophagus or Barrett's esophagus. Now, before I come uh, talk about the dysplasias in Barrett's, I just would like to uh, touch on a few uh, common and uh, non uh, malignant uh, topics here. For example, while we are on this particular slide, uh, let's talk about the uh, reflux uh, disease symptoms or the features. Now, what we see uh, in the reflux conditions are like what you're seeing here. So there is a bit of a basal uh, zone uh, hypertrophy and, uh, oh, sorry, hyperplasia. And there is this, what you see is congested uh, papillae. Uh, not much uh, papillae is here, but then the underlying stroma shows inflammation, congestion, and there is some scattered uh, inflammatory cell infiltrate, although it's not very uh, pronounced here. But then uh, you've got to bear in mind, keep in mind that some lymphocytes can be uh, found in even in normal uh, squamous mucosa. So the appearances uh, we say uh, would be suggestive of a reflux esophagitis here in this case. Now, You've got to look for carefully for uh, any uh, neutrophilic infiltrate. If there are some neutrophils on the surface uh, epithelium, then uh, again, like you know, a PSD or Grokot stain would be helpful to uh, rule out any candida. Uh, then you've got to look carefully for any uh, herpes uh, simplex uh, inclusions. Like for example, you'll see the glassy inclusions by nuclear uh, cells or any uh, CMV uh, inclusions. So these are the sort of things which uh, you should uh, look out for. Now, let's talk about eosinophilic esophagitis, which is again, uh, very commonly uh, asked for by the clinicians. So the, the, clinician, the patient comes with dysphagia and uh, the, or stricture, and the clinician, they do often query, is this uh, eosinophilic esophagitis? 
Now you've got to be careful here, like because uh, some amount of uh, eosinophils are, are quite commonly seen in cases of uh, reflux esophagitis. So how do we distinguish uh, eosinophilic esophagitis from the reflux? And there are certain criteria. Now, before going to that, let's talk about briefly about uh, some of the salient features. So this is most commonly uh, male uh, predominant and uh, the peak incidence uh, ranges from 30 to 44 years of age. Most commonly seen in cold and arid climate, uh, can diffusely affect the entire length of the esophagus. So although it says like, you know, uh, upper and middle esophagus is commonly seen, but then it can affect the, any length of esophagus. However, the biopsies need to be taken from proximal, mid and distal esophagus with a minimum of two biopsies per site. Now, there are certain criteria to diagnose uh, eosinophilic esophagitis. So you've got a major criteria and you've got a minor criteria. Now you can see in the picture here that you can see this chunk of like an eosinophil forming an eosinophilic abscess. Now this can't be uh, reflux esophagitis. So, so the major criteria is you see more than equal to 15 eosinophils per high power, power field. Now, this should be from the most uh, densely populated uh, eosinophilic area in the um, uh, squamous mucosa. And the, there are minor criteria like extreme basal zone hyperplasia with papillary hyperplasia or eosinophils concentrate on the surface epithelium rather than the basal ones. And then you can see microapsises or eosinophilic degranulation, surface uh, desquamation or lamina propria fibrosis, although we don't have a lamina propria here. But then that is also another clue. Okay, so now let's come back to the dysplasias uh, in Barrett's. So first of all, uh, we talk about indefinite uh, for dysplasia. Now, right, let me just put this, yeah. So, what you see here is this columnar esophagus uh, with some nuclear stratification in the deeper crypts. Uh, there is mild nuclear stratification, mild nuclear hypochromasia. But if you see carefully, uh, these nuclear changes do not extend onto the surface epithelium. So the surface epithelium looks pretty much okay. There's no goblet cell metaplasia here. Uh, there's background inflammation and some uh, inflammatory cells uh, extend into the cryptopithelium as well. So now we say here again, as like we reported earlier, the features are in keeping with, but not specific for columnar and esophagus or Barrett's esophagus, provided the biopsy is taken from the native esophagus. And then uh, we tend to say uh, the appearances, uh, considering the fact that there is a background inflammation are most likely to represent indefinite uh, for dysplasia or best regarded as indefinite for dysplasia rather than true dysplasia here. Now, another uh, scenario here. Now, it's quite evident from this field. It has that adenomatous appearance, what you see in uh, colonic polyps. Now, this is a low-grade dysplasia. What you see here is there is nuclear stratification, nuclear hypochromasia, nuclear pleomorphism. And these, the most important thing to notice here is these changes extend onto the surface epithelium. See, the surface epithelium also shows uh, the features. Now, the thing to uh, see or notice here is uh, the nuclear polarity is still maintained. It's not very half a set. So, so there is crowding, but then the polarity is still maintained. The architecture is more or less preserved. So this would be a low grade dysplasia. Now what happens in the high grade dysplasia is the polarity is lost and there is marked, uh, you can see in this insert, there's marked nuclear hypochromasia, there's nuclear routing and uh, the, uh, there is cribriform architecture as well with some uh, intraluminal uh, propylate formation. So this would be a high-grade dysplasia. Now, here what you see is 
slightly more than a high grade dysplasia. You've got this uh, esophageal depth scrubs, mucosa, with the glandular mucosa. There is some patchy intercellular aplasia, so this is Barrett. And what you see here is uh, this crowding of uh, the glands here. There is uh, almost like a sheet like formation here with some uh, single uh, cell infiltration there. And there is some group reforming. So this is more than a high grade dysplasia. This would be regarded as intramucosal adenoblastoma, as there is breaking of the uh, basement membrane and uh, the cells are into the, in the lamina propria, although it, the cells have not crossed the muscularis mucosa. So now the important thing to uh, realize is, and it is also recommended by the PSG guidelines, uh, the other British Society of Gastroenterologists guidelines, that all these dysplasias should be double reported by another pathologist. Uh, and both the pathologist names should go uh, on the report. Now, this is the most uh, uh, important um, step in diagnosing uh, dysplasias in parrots. And these are usually uh, discussed in the um, upper GIM DMs as well, specifically, specifically uh, high-grade dysplasias and uh, intramucosal carcinomas. So let's talk about the spindle cell lesions in the stomach. Now, spindle cell lesions uh, can be challenging, uh, especially with, uh, you cannot diagnose uh, most of the spindle cell lesions without the immunohistochemistry. So the first one here, which uh, I would like to talk about is the inflammatory fibroid polyp. Now, this is, the, the patient presents with a polyp and the, what you see, or, or the uh, submucosal mass. Now, what you see is the, there is this glandular mucosa and in the submucosa, there is a lesion composed of spindle cells and some uh, stellate shaped stromal cells. Now, if you look carefully on the high bar, there are like scattered, uh, eosinophils. So this this is quite rich in uh, eosinophil, eosinophils. And if you do the immunohistochemistry, so so basically uh, we try to exclude a GIST as well. So we will uh, include the GIST markers and some uh, neural uh, markers like S100. So the GIST markers, which is uh, CD117, DOG1, and the neural mark S100, they are all negative here. The positive stain uh, are CD34 and SMA. So this is a, an example of uh, inflammatory fibroid polyp. And this is a benign lesion, it's not malignant. Right, now the most common recent common lesion of the uh, GI is the GIST or gastrointestinal uh, stromal tumor. Now, this, is, this arises from uh, interstitial cells of cardial within the myentric plexus of the muscularis propria. There is mutation in the proton gene kit, or it shows a PDG of RA mutations as well. Now, uh, broadly speaking, the uh, morphology uh, can be of spindle cells, can be epithelioid, or can be mixed type. Now, the prognosis depends on the tumor size, the mitotic rate, and the site of origin. So this is the most common uh, uh, tumor of the GI. Now, so we, what we do is, what you see here is the spindle cells on the HNE, and this could be, to be honest, this could be anything like this. So that, therefore, uh, we tend to include all the histochemical uh, a markers for spindle cell. Now, if you see here, this is CD34, which is strongly positive, then secant or CD117 is strongly positive here. And now you see the uh, key 67 index is very, very low. So it's less than 2%. And uh, on the high power field, uh, you don't see, see mitosis uh, uh, 
uh, here. But mitotic rate is an important thing uh, to count, uh, especially uh, it, uh, when you know that it's a decisive factor in terms of the prognosis. Right. So the negative markers are the Tesmin S100. So it excludes like a smooth muscle uh, tumor and it excludes the neural tumor. Now the gastric uh, gist, so the risk of disease progression uh, is as you see here. So in a case of uh, where the size is more than 10 centimeters and if the mitosis is less than or equal to five mitosis per 50 hypoph field, the risk is moderate. The risk is high if it is more than five mitosis per 50 hypoph field. But in a case of uh, where the tumor is less than or equal to two centimeters, uh, there is no risk progression at all. Right, so uh, another spinal cell lesion, which is a schwannoma here, uh, so we still have to do all the markers and it's quite like a characteristic. Uh, there are some helpful uh, clues, even in HNE, and uh, as you see in the schwannoma, there is uh, the interlacing bundles of uh, spinal cells and collagen. It's quite well circumscribed, unencapsulated lesion. And there is nuclear palisading, there is varicose bodies. And uh, another important uh, helpful clue would be hollenized vessels. So where you see the vessels, just look carefully around the vessels, uh, you'll see the hollenized wall of the vessel. And this is again, but uh, a very helpful clue. You may not see this uh, uh, in most cases or in all cases, but where you see this, this is very helpful. This is the peripheral cuff of uh, lymphocytes uh, surrounding the lesion. So the positive stains will be S100, Wymenton, and negative stain will be DOG1, CKIT, C34, SMA, and Desmin. Now, the other differential here uh, would be a lyomyoma. Now, in lyomyoma, you see the short fascicles, uh, and it's got the blunt uh, end nuclei or cigar shaped nuclei. And uh, the markers there would be positive for smooth muscle markers like SMA. Uh, Desmin and uh, Caldesmon, whereas the, again, the uh, GIST markers, uh, including the neuromarkers, will be negative. So that's, uh, again, an important differential. Now, another uh, interesting lesion is a Solgy fibrous tumor. So what you see uh, in a Solgy fibrous tumor is uh, the haphazard arrangement of the spindle cells now, this is also called a patternless pattern, um, uh, commonly called. And another interesting uh, clue here will be this. If you see carefully the arrangement of vessels, they've got a uh, dilated uh, branching of stagon, uh, which is called a hemangiopericytoma like vasculature. And uh, the stroma can have a variable collagen. And however, here in this particular picture, uh, uh, what uh, you see is a very striking big side changes, which is again, uh, an important clue in uh, SFT lesions. Now, these are rarely associated with adenocarcinoma or adenoma. And uh, the positive stains here would be CD34 and STAT6. Now STAT6 is a very um, uh, sensitive and specific marker of uh, SFT. BCL2 and CD99 can also be positive. The negative stains here would be S100, SOX10, cytokeratin, and Desmin. Right, so that's the end of uh, today's uh, session. And thank you once again uh, to LG Patla for allowing me to present on this platform. Thank you.